And we always say that we think that people were, um, you know, that, that a crop like it was this year might have been just a day or two away from, you know, the connections with the soil water sort of breaking and the thing really deteriorating. And even though we had high temperatures there at the end of August and again the second week of September, those actually sandwiched a week when the temperatures were pretty moderate and uh, with cool nights. So I think what we had was a, a crop that, you know, just sort of kept going and was probably on the verge of giving up at some point. Once we started to see the crop, you know, not dying early. In other words, it was maturing about when the growing degree days said it should. Then we knew that, you know, that it was still getting water and enough to make, to fill the kernels out completely and that's what happened. It's a year producers are going to remember for a long time, I would think. Well, every year, <laughs> I guess, is that uh, some, some disappoint, but uh, we expected that the yields would be pretty good, and it all started with good um, pollination conditions and good kernel numbers, but we didn't expect they would be really good. In other words, the highest, some people are talking about the highest yields they've ever had. And you wouldn't look back on the weather of 2013 and say that about either corn or soybeans, especially about soybeans, which are in some ways a bigger surprise than, than corn. I haven't seen our data from our irrigated study out here, but it was planted in a field that lies pretty low. And there's a pretty good indication that the irrigation isn't going to make a huge difference in soybean yields. But I don't think the soybean yields in general in that field are going to be very good. So the soybeans had the same thing and more surprising in terms of just having water clearly available at a time when we thought they should have run out and uh, came on and made better pod numbers and then filled those pods uh, better than we expected them to. Was that the September, the mid-September rains that finished that process off or were they able to tap down into the subsoil moisture levels that were well really what, good from early in the season. I mean we didn't hear we didn't have September rains. I mean we only had a half inch of rain in August and another half inch in September. And so you just have to think that they tapped into enough water to keep them going. And we're not unlike corn yields, we don't have people saying they have the best soybean yields ever. I think the surprising thing is that the the poorer soybean yields aren't worse than they are, and people that thought they'd get 40 are getting 50. Um, and so that's, that's a good thing, certainly, uh, but just as unexpected, probably more unexpected than the good corn yields we have. Take me through the 240, 259, 277. Well, we had an irrigation study on soybean last year and found that under an extremely dry year, we raised, we raised soybean yields by about 10 bushel or so, or 11. We raised soybean yields by about 11 bushel last year out here. And that was from something like 70 bushel up to a little over 80 bushel. And 70 was a real surprise. I mean, it was dry enough that we thought soybean yields last year would really have been bump, bumped up by irrigation. The difference between last year and this year was that last year was very dry and then it got good moisture towards the end of the season. It was in time to help the soybean crop, but not really help the corn crop, which was pretty much done in at pollination time. The weather this year was completely upside down from that. It was wet early, and then it got dry after the pollination period was over with. Really in August and September then, we had very little rainfall in much of the state. And so the, the two years could hardly be any different in that regard. And the other difference was very high temperatures in 2012 through, certainly through the middle part of the season. We'll all remember the, the 95 to 100 degree temperatures uh, that just persisted for days on end. This year we had some high temperatures, but it was really limited to sort of a middle week of July. It got a little warm, but then it was cool before that and cool after that. And we don't think that had a negative effect. And then really the warmest, driest weather of the year came in the last week of August and about the second week in September. 
where we got up into the 90s and it was increasingly drying out. So when we had irrigation, uh, we, we followed the irrigated soybeans last year with irrigated corn this year, and we thought this would be, with the dry weather we had after mid-July, we thought that irrigation would make quite a difference. And some people might remember that in mid-August, at the time of the agronomy day, I suggested we might have 300 bushel yields with irrigation in our corn crop. It really looked like a very good crop. And, uh, and it turns out it was a good crop. The really surprising thing, though, is with a total of one inch of rain in August and September, and with irrigation, we added over nine inches of water during that period. So one set of plots there had 9.7 more inches of water than the other set, and it made a difference in yield of less than 20 bushel. And um, the, I guess the shock was that many people saw in their own fields this year that without adding water and without adding more nitrogen, that um, the crop yielded 240 bushels per acre. And so that was just with base amounts, basically 180 pounds of nitrogen for corn following soybean, which is pretty much in the vicinity of what we think is the right amount. And when we didn't have irrigation and we had the 240 bushel yield, adding more nitrogen or adding foliar fungicide really didn't do anything to help that yield. And uh, foliar fungicide in this trial didn't do anything at all, no matter whether we irrigated or not. And I think it's just a reminder to us that sometimes we put these inputs on with a hope or in, in a year like this probably pretty good confidence and we hear that phrase a lot that good yields will be even better if we use some of these inputs and foliar fungicide is one of those that help with stress and, and this sort of thing. And we're going to have conditions where these inputs simply don't produce any return at all and certainly in this trial it was, was one of those times. Now, unfortunately, these things turn out to be pretty unpredictable, and we've seen some responses uh, to fungicide where we didn't expect them, but we've also seen quite a few non-responses, even including in some cases, uh, places, say, with some wet weather and maybe even little disease, where we expect to see responses, we don't always see them. So it reminds us of this sort of most limiting factor idea. You know, what in every field was the most limiting factor? And in this one, we would probably say it might have been water, but, you know, adding only, starting at 240, <laughs> you'd say, well, there weren't any really big limitations on yield or we wouldn't have yields like that. Now, adding nitrogen when we did irrigate, and we added about 19 bushel per acre just by irrigating, so just adding water added 19 bushels per acre. Well, that's a lot of water. Uh, nine point some inches is a lot of water to get 19 bushel yield return. But if we were equipped to irrigate, it probably would have paid for itself. Nitrogen, uh, adding nitrogen along with the water then bumped the yields up even further. And we were then at 277 bushels if we added both water and nitrogen. As I said, we put fungicide on half the plots as well, but it really didn't do anything no matter what else we had added. So you're left with a yield that, you know, at 277 is certainly not a shabby yield. I suspect we might have some farm fields this year come close to that um, without adding water or extra nitrogen. But we also have quite a few people that add extra nitrogen you know, just in, in case they might be getting uh, conditions for higher yields. And I've, when we saw some response, only when we added water this year, obviously just going and putting more nitrogen on wasn't a key to getting our yields bumped up. We had some other data come in on nitrogen. <clears throat> One site in western Illinois, we had about 18 inches of rainfall between the first week of April and the first week of June. And so we took advantage of that, went back and put some supplemental nitrogen on somewhere. We had put it on there in the first week of April. And we put it on as UAN, and of course the nitrate can go 
as soon as it rains. And when it rains 18 inches, you figure quite a bit of that nitrogen might have gone. Been lost is the term we use. Uh, certainly move deeper in the soil than we care to look. Um, but I think uh, when we added supplemental nitrogen, 60 pounds in the first week of June after all of this rainfall, we really didn't significantly increase the yield. And that crop only had 165 pounds of nitrogen put on as UAN, corn following soybean. And the yield levels were about 240. So I think we learn a lot of things from a year like this, um, particularly with regard to kind of our mental image of what's happening in the soil and in the crop. And we just find out sometimes that uh, this crop may be a little more resilient and nitrogen that we think is lost may not actually be lost. In fact, a year like this where we needed the water later in the season, we re can keep in mind that the water coming up from lower uh, levels in the soil to feed the crop brought nitrogen with it. And so we really didn't see the big responses to nitrogen that, that we typically would expect uh, in a year with such good yields. On that note, producers are going to say to themselves, last year we didn't use the nitrogen uh, or other nutrients. Uh, is that the reason? And so the question then is, that nitrogen that's deep in the soil that came up, would that be residual nitrogen from previous years? They're going to say, well, I put 180 pounds on, but maybe I had 75 or 80 or 90 pounds left over from last year or I, I, something along those lines. Right. The, that would only apply to corn this year that followed corn last year. Most of the data I've seen so far are corn, is corn following soybean. And so generally the soybean crop is scouring out most of the available nitrogen. We didn't ever find uh, nitrogen following soybeans last year, uh, whether we looked in the fall or looked again this spring. I think what you say about where corn followed corn, was there some effect? And um, certainly with the rainfall we had till spring, when we looked in the spring this last year, we found that a lot of that nitrogen we saw last fall wasn't there at least in the top two feet anymore. Um, it probably wasn't gone or completely gone, uh, but only in corn following corn would we expect there to be some effect of that. In a general sense, um, when we get high yields, we, always, we often tend to think that either nitrogen or maybe plant population limited the yields that we got when, when they're this high. You say, well, it ran out of something, and nitrogen is a convenient thing to, to bring up. <clears throat> I think partly because the last half of the season was dry and that the, the water, you know, unlike some years when you get lots of water early and, and uh, the root systems are damaged on the crop so that it can't take up water later. And in 2010, this was a really big issue in much of the central Illinois where the root systems, you know, there was water and nitrogen there two feet down, the root system just couldn't effectively take it up. And so we, we live and learn, I guess, and every year is going to be different like that. One producer in western Illinois had a field, I, he told me that it yielded 230. And I kind of jokingly asked him what he did wrong, and he said, well, he thought that more plants would have been an advantage. And I, that's possible that little higher populations might have yielded more, but we, we tend to put a little too much emphasis on what we could have done differently. And the fact is that the weather pattern was unique, and it, that means that the responses to things like nitrogen and population are probably going to be somewhat unique as well. And the things that we normally after a season, we always want to identify what it was that we could have done to increase the yields even further. In some cases, I mean, we, we can imagine that, but we really can't tell for sure. Normally, if we're in the mid-30s or higher population, say 35, 36,000 at harvest, uh, 
our data would suggest often you don't really get much increase if you go higher than that. And I think with our hybrids, uh, if they've formed a very good canopy and have very good kernel numbers, that it's a little, you know, we can again imagine that going up to 42 or 44,000 might have increased the yield. But our data would suggest uh, that this probably doesn't happen very much, that our populations limit yields, unless they were simply too low at the beginning of the season uh, due to wet weather and some of this kind of thing. And we had some areas in some of our trials that did have populations reduced by standing water and so on early. And certainly in those cases, there are some, some that would have benefited from higher populations. But you know, it's always hard to argue with yields of 230, 240, 250 bushel. Um, and while it's maybe convenient to speculate about, well, how could they have been 260 or 270, uh, it's often going to be very difficult to really pin down what that was. Uh, some people noted the low sunlight amounts in some areas this year. Uh, certainly sunlight was less than normal, but sunlight's a tricky one because our maximum amounts tend to come with our driest, warmest weather. We had huge sunlight in 2012 and, and awful yields in many cases. Uh, with better water, the sunlight does you a lot of good. If, if water is your main limitation, then sunlight tends not to be one. This would have been one year when sunlight might have been somewhat limiting. Um, but getting up into those yield levels means that everything else, you know, every input that the plant has access to, you know, providing more of that would only provide relatively small increases. And um, while we all would like the elusive 300 uh, bushels per acre, it's, uh, it's difficult to anticipate that we can sort of strong arm corn to that level by just throwing in more inputs.